Yo, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of the SWUS MLB Wednesday. We actually got 17 games on the board, but four of them are legs of double headers. So obviously I'll most likely be skipping those. As far as Tuesday, I just got done with the Tuesday night from hell. Man, I think my bets are going to go 0-6. I'm currently 0-4, um, but I, no, it's going to be 0-5. I, just a terrible, terrible night. And you know what's the crazy? You know what the craziest part is? Deep down, I knew it. Listen to what I said on the live show. This is at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Overall, baseball's been really kind to me recently. Hopefully that continues. Tonight's slate is terrible, though. I hate my bets tonight. So if, if you're looking for a, a day not to tell me, this might be today. I really don't like my bets tonight, and I have six of them, too. I'm hoping they all get f***ing rained out. I don't like them. <laughs> I don't like them. I should have just cashed out of all six of my bets at that moment. Oh, yeah, and by the way, I bet the Mariners. I won that one, or I'm winning that one. They're up 7-1, I think. Didn't post it on the website. Forgot to post it on the website. So my only win, I can't even count it on my record because I forgot to post it. So... <laughs> Man, couldn't catch a break tonight. Sincerely apologize to everyone who tailed. Haven't had a rough night like that in a long time. Uh, let's keep our head up. Turn it around. We got loaded baseball days coming up before the All-Star break. Uh, remember to bet responsibly. Keep your unit sizes low before the All-Star break can get a little weird. So maybe dial it back a little bit. Uh, but yeah, let's work on getting it back. MLB Wednesday, 17 games. Let's go. Welcome to the Swiss. This was. Hey, get the source. So first game on the board is actually Royals Cardinals, but it's the first leg of a double header. Very slim chance I bet this one. I'm not even gonna get into it. Um, if you're new to the channel, we usually don't bet on double headers because often the, the bullpen management can be really unpredictable. Sometimes guys get sat out of the lineup last minute. I've lost too many <laughs> bets on double headers in frustrating fashion. Uh, so I'm going to skip this one for now. Um, also, next game up is Twins White Sox. Same situation. The game got postponed due to rain. Uh, so this one's a double header as well. I'm going to skip this one as well. Um, so let's move right along to Cubs O's in Baltimore. Uh, O's are favored at home here, minus 168. Total sitting at eight and a half. Imanaga is on the mound for the Cubs. Corbin Burns pitching for the O's. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got to lean on Baltimore through five innings, 2.99 to 2.06. Lean on Baltimore final score as well, 5.44 to 3.84. So before we get into this one, let's look at some ROI numbers. Uh, Baltimore's been much more profitable than the Cubs this year, plus 9.3% ROI in the season. Cubs are minus 8.1%. Baltimore's been profitable as home, at home as well, plus 5.8% and slightly above zero in the last 10 games. Uh, Cubs minus 20.2 percent on the road minus 41.4 percent in their last 10 road games so ROI numbers definitely point you toward, towards Baltimore before we even get started here and let's start with the Cubbies bats not looking great in the last 30 days this is a bottom 10 lineup same goes for the last 14 days the last seven days as far as their numbers on the road kind of the same I mean on the season this is a borderline bottom 10 road lineup in the last 30 days maybe slightly better than that um just below average for the cubs on the road as far as their numbers against right-handed pitching again kind of the same thing slightly below average here 18th in wrc plus 20th in ops tw uh 20th in woba in the last 30 days against right-handed pitching last 14 days last seven days look pretty much identical to that uh, if you look at their numbers against righty starters I mean, last seven righty starters to pitch against the Cubs, 419 ERA, 122 whip. So they're not getting blanked by righty starters, but they're not really getting to them either. Uh, if you pull up the game logs, I mean, Jose Soriano, three earned runs, seven base runners or five innings. That's okay. Um, got to Griffin Canning on uh, July 5th, but before that, they didn't get to Wheeler, didn't get to Freddie Peralta. They got to Tobias Myers a little bit, didn't get to Colin Rea. Um, so, I mean, the Cubs have been... I mean, pretty much right what their numbers indicate against right-handed stars. About average, slightly below average, maybe. That being said, as I'm recording this, they've already got four runs against Dean Kramer tonight. Uh, so we can add another righty starter to the list that the Cubs did get to. That game's only in the third inning. The bases are loaded. They've already got four. Uh, and I've got the under in that one. <laughs> Just beautiful. So, yeah, they got to Dean Kramer. Um, but Corbin Burns is most definitely not Dean Creamer. I mean, on the season, 232 ERA, 102 whip. He's been absolutely excellent. Last seven starts, last two starts, he hasn't slowed down his, at all. Uh, his numbers at home are even better than that, actually. On the season at home, he's got a 178 ERA, 112 whip. Last six home starts, last three home starts, he hasn't slowed down at all. Here are his game logs, and I mean, 
The Phillies gave him some problems back on June 16th, but even that start, six innings, two earned runs. They got nine base runners, but even that's a solid start. Um, I mean, he's been pretty excellent every single time he takes the mound. He does have worse splits against righty bats. You can see 296 Wobin and 112 Whip. Not that that's bad, but it's significantly worse than his numbers against lefties. Cubs aren't really a righty heavy lineup, though. They're projected to have four lefties in the lineup, five righties. So really nothing to take away from there. Um, as far as the pitch mix, though, he is heavily reliant on the cutter. And the Cubs do have nice hitting numbers against the cutter. In the last 30 days, they're the 12th best lineup in baseball against the Cub fastball. So if you are looking to back the Cubs, you can point at that. And actually check this out. Corbin Burns, last four starts against the Cubs, he's 0-3 with a 242 ERA and an even one whip. Weird numbers here, because a 242 ERA and an even one whip, those are fine, but he's 0-3 in four starts. So hasn't gotten the run support. Cubs have been able to beat this guy. And the current Cubs lineup against Corbin Burns, they're hitting 282 lifetime off him with an 829 OPS. So the current Cubs hitters haven't had problems hitting off Corbin Burns. So I I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't want to put myself in a position where I'm betting against Corbin Burns. He's been one of the best pitchers in baseball this year. But the Cubs do have nice numbers against them. On the other side, we got the Baltimore Bats. And as we know, one of the best lineups in baseball in the last 30 days, second across the board. Same goes for the last 14 days. Numbers at home, excellent. On the season, this is a top five home lineup. Last 30 days, top 10 home lineup. Uh, everything's good there. Now we get to their numbers against left-handed pitching, and this is where this one gets interesting. Uh, now, if you look at these numbers here, it looks fine. In the last 30 days, top half lineup versus lefties. Thing is, they haven't really seen a ton of lefty starters recently, and if you pull up these numbers here against lefty starters, these aren't great for the O's. The last eight lefties to start a game against Baltimore, 328 ERA, 114 whip. Same, about the same type of number for the last five lefty starters. And if you pull up the game logs, they got to Logan Allen on June 25th, and they got to Max Fried on June 11th. Other than that, the other five lefties in these game logs here were all able to pitch great games against Baltimore. In fact, Andrew Heaney blanked them. Framber Valdez, excellent game. Nestor Cortez blanked them. Ranger Suarez, excellent game. So I don't know if I buy into the Baltimore numbers against left-handed pitching. I'm looking at the lefty starters that have seen Baltimore, and for the most part, they haven't had problems with them. Which brings us to Imanaga. Um, now, in his last seven starts, he's got a 651 ERA. But as we've talked about, there's a few really bad starts in his game logs that are skewing his numbers a bit. Um, if you look at his numbers on the road, on the season, he's got a 288 ERA and a 120 whip on the road, which is excellent. Last three road starts, 635 ERA. But even if you look at the whip there, 129, that's really not bad. Here are the game logs, and you can see the starts I'm talking about. I mean, the Grimace Mets crushed him. 10 earned runs, 11 hits in just three innings. That's kind of skewing everything. Um, also, White Sox were able to give him some problems, but he only allowed one run in that game. Brewers got him May 29th. So if you look at the other starts on here, I mean, Phillies, six innings pitch, three earned runs, seven base runners. That's a solid start. On the road in San Francisco, six innings pitch, three earned runs, seven base runners. That's a solid start. Uh, it's really just the Mets and Brewers games that are just really screwing his numbers up. Other than that, there's some nice looking starts on here. So Imanag has been pretty solid. And we really need to figure out what our thoughts are on this Baltimore lineup versus lefties right now. If you go by the game logs and the lefty starters they've seen, I'd say they're closer to bottom 10 than top 10. And the reason I bring that up is look how dominant Imanaga's been when he's pitched against bottom 10 lineups versus lefties. 101 ERA and an 084 whip. So he's absolutely dominated lineups that can't hit lefties. And I don't know. I don't know if I'd call Baltimore that, but I definitely put him closer to the bottom 10 versus lefties than the top 10 right now. As far as his righty lefty splits, I mean, not much to take away here. Uh, he is slightly better against lefty bats, but it's really not significant at all. Uh, Baltimore will have seven righties in the lineup for this one. Uh, so again, just nothing really to take away here. Uh, as far as his pitch mix, he really only throws two. Four-seam fastball and the splitter. Baltimore top 10 against both those pitches. As far as making a prediction on this side, I do think Imanaga could pitch a good game. Um, I don't have a ton of faith in him, but... I don't trust this Baltimore lineup to get to lefties. So in the first five, even though Corbin Burns seems like the much better starter, I actually put the, the matchup about even, maybe even slightly leaning towards the Cubs. And when we get to the bullpen matchup, you got to go Cubs here. In the last 30 days, the Cubs bullpen, 8th in ERA, 11th in Woba. Expected FIP numbers indicate they've had some good luck, but still, look how, how much the Baltimore bullpen has fallen off. 
last 30 days. I mean, the last 14 days, Baltimore's been one of the worst bullpens in baseball. So actually, the Cubs bullpen has been performing better than Baltimore's. Offensively against bullpens, though, no question. Orioles by a mile. The Cubs haven't been, haven't been doing shit in the late innings. So pretty even. The matchup in the late innings, pretty even. So as far as betting this game, I took the Cubs money line. I got it at plus 146. Um, definitely some risk involved in this one. Something that a lot of people do, and myself included, I'm definitely guilty of this at times. Um, they let a bad day affect their decision making the next day. And I feel like after a losing day, you're going to want to gravitate towards what you perceive to be a safer bet. But screw that. Let's not sway the course playing these dogs when we find angles we like because it's been good to us this year. Um, I think at plus 146, it's worth a shot. So I took the, the Cubs money line in this one. Next up, we got Cleveland on the road in Detroit. Tigers are home dogs here, plus 122. Total sitting at seven and a half. We got Tanner Bybee on the mound for Cleveland. Reese Olsen getting the start for the Tigers. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got a slight lean on Cleveland after five innings, 2.25 to 2.02. Slight lean on Cleveland final score as well, 4.03 to 3.67. So before we get into this one, let's look at some ROI numbers. Uh, Cleveland obviously has been more profitable than the Tigers this year, plus 13.9% on the season. Tigers are minus 7.3%. In the last 10 games, though, Detroit's been the hotter ticket, plus 25.6%. Cleveland at minus 15.9%. Uh, as far as their numbers on the road, last 10 games, minus 39% for Cleveland. Tigers haven't been profitable at home, though. Uh, so ROI numbers definitely point towards Cleveland. And let's get it started and start looking at Cleveland's offensive numbers here. In the last 30 days, still a top 10 lineup, but last 14 days last seven days looking closer to average as far as their numbers on the road kind of the same last 30 days slightly above average 13th 12th and 13th as far as their numbers against right-handed pitching again looking average now i mean this was one of the best lineups in baseball against righties if we rewind a month um but in the last 30 days 12th 13th and 13th if you look at their numbers against righty starters this is where it gets interesting and we were talking about this on the live show last seven righty starters the pitch against the guardians 220 era and a 110 whip so they have not been getting to righty starters. That being said, as I'm recording this, they are smacking Kenta Maeda around. Is hitting Kenta Maeda up enough for us to start believing in this Cleveland lineup against righty starters again? I'd say no. Um, but if we pull up the game logs, you can see it clear as day. They're not getting to righty starters. Again, I know they got to Kenta Maeda. Um, but on this chart here, got to Birdsong a little bit. But Eric Fetty, Chris Flexen, Seth Lugo, Alec Marsh, Michael Waka, Grace Rodriguez, all pitched great games against this Cleveland lineup. So I'm sure Cleveland is going to bounce back and start crushing righty starters again. They're a lineup loaded with lefties, have a lot of talent. We know they're going to bounce back. It, it, the question is, when is that going to happen? Now, Reese Olsen has only made one career start against Cleveland. It was actually May 8th, uh, so two months ago. Uh, he was great. Six innings pitched, just one hit, two earned runs. So he pitched great against this Cleveland lineup a couple months back. And you know what? Reese Olsen's having a great season. On the year, 322 ERA, 118 whip. Last six starts, 459 ERA, but the last two starts, 231. We take a look at his numbers at home, pretty solid here. I mean, on the season at home, 332, 118. Last five home starts sitting up at 420, the ERA. So Reese Olsen, we know he's been pretty solid. And if you look at his game logs, again, solid. Solid game against the Reds, solid game against the Angels, solid game against the White Sox, great game against the Braves. Four starts in a row, he's been looking pretty impressive. Now, if we scroll back to early June, you can find some instances here. Uh, the Red Sox gave him some problems, the Nationals gave him some problems, the Brewers gave him some problems, but four starts in a row where Reese Olsen has looked great. But now we get to his righty-lefty splits, and this is where I start to get a little bit concerned for Reese Olsen. Uh, he struggles against lefty bats. 306 Woba and a 130 whip against lefties. Definitely worse than his numbers against righties. And the reason I bring that up is, as we know, Cleveland's loaded with lefties. Eight lefties in the lineup for the Guardians. Most lefty-heavy lineup in baseball. So I definitely don't love the look of that for Reese Olsen. Also, his pitch mix. His main two pitches, the slider and the four-seam fastball. Cleveland's been hitting those. Ninth and 12th in the last 30 days. So as much as I like Reese Olsen and I'm down to back this guy, and I also think the Cleveland lineup might be slightly still overvalued, I don't like this matchup for him, and if Cleveland's snapping out of this, uh, this this slump against righty starters tonight with Kenta Maeda, I don't want to be anywhere near the other side of this. All those lefties against Reese Olsen, I expect them to get uh, the, the Guardians to score runs on them. On the other side, we got the Tigers bats, and as we know, this is a bad lineup. In the last 30 days, they are bottom 10 WRC plus OPS, well, but bottom 10 across the board. Last seven days, they've been a top 10 lineup, but obviously that's a crazy small sample size. Uh, as far as their numbers at home, terrible. 
on the season. Bottom 10, maybe even close to bottom five lineup at home. Numbers against right-handed pitching also looking bad on the last 30 days. Bottom 10, maybe even bottom five lineup against righties. Now, again, in the last seven days, numbers look pretty good, but super small sample size there. Uh, the last four righty starters to pitch against Detroit, 242 ERA and a 139 whip. So they haven't been scoring runs on righty starters. And here are the game logs. You can see they did get to Graham Ashcraft a little bit. Just one earned run, but nine base runners is solid. Uh, other than that, I mean, didn't touch Hunter Green. They got to Carson Spears, actually hit him up. And that's probably the <laughs> a big part of the reason you're seeing some nice looking hitting numbers against righties in the last seven days is that game against Carson Spears and the Graham Ashcraft one. Um, but it's pretty clear other than that, they are not getting to righty starters. I don't trust this Tigers lineup at all. I also don't like how the Tigers have done a ton of their damage against bad righties. Uh, look at their numbers against righties with an ERA above five. They're a top five lineup, but against righties with an ERA below 350, one of the worst lineups in baseball. Now, Tanner Bybee's ERA is 367, but definitely much closer to the below 350 category than the above five. Tanner Bybee's been great this season. Now, to be fair to Detroit, Tanner Bybee has struggled against this team. He's made three career starts against the Tigers. He's 0-2 with a 782 ERA and a 174 whip. So he's struggled against the Tigers in the past, but he's definitely having the best season of his young career. I mean, uh, on the year, 367 ERA, 112 whip. Last four starts, 278 ERA, 097 whip. Uh, look at his numbers on the road. On the year, 270 ERA, 104 whip. Last four road starts, last two road starts looking solid. Here is game logs, and you can see he struggled against the Giants on July 5th. Other than that, I mean, great game against the Royals in Kansas City. Great game against the Orioles in Baltimore. Shut the Mariners down. Um, even that game against the Reds where he gave up four runs, that's a solid start. Just five base runners and five and a third innings pitch. Great game against the Royals. Great game against the Nats. As we know, Tanner Bybee is having a great season, and this is a guy I can trust. The thing that concerns me with Tanner Bybee is his numbers against lefty bats. 347 Wobin, a 137 whip. It's substantial splits here. He's much, much better against righty bats, but the Tigers lineup doesn't really have a ton of lefties in it. Just four lefties in the lineup. Now, three of their first five hitters are lefties, and I mean, Riley Green, there's some dangerous, I mean, a dangerous lefty, maybe we could say, in the Tigers lineup. But as a whole, this isn't a lineup that scares me. It's not loaded with lefty bats. So not really concerned there uh, for Tanner Bybee in this particular spot. And we do have to mention that he throws the four-seam fastball a lot. 43.8% of his pitches are four-seam fastballs, and the Tigers are one of the worst lineups in baseball against that pitch in the last 30 days. So I like that spot. I like Tanner Bybee on the road. I like the matchup for him. A little concerned about Riley Green, a couple of the lefties in the Tigers lineup. But as a whole, I think uh, Tanner Bybee should throw a great one here. As far as the bullpen matchups in this one, yes, we do have to acknowledge that the Guardians bullpen has definitely not been producing at the same level recently. In the last 14 days, is actually looking more like an average bullpen. But still, we know that overall, they've been the best bullpen in baseball this year, and they still are miles better than the Tigers. So even though Cleveland's bullpen's been a little shaky recently, I still give them the edge over Detroit. Offensively against bullpens, got to give the slight edge to Cleveland, even though they've started slumping in that category as well. Uh, but still, advantage in the late innings goes to Cleveland. As far as betting this game, I think Tanner Bybee's going to deal. I like Reese Olsen, but I'm worried about all those lefties in the Cleveland lineup. I think we can count on the Guardians to get at least a couple runs across on them. The reason I'm hesitant to back Cleveland here is the bullpen usage. Look at this. I mean, they use Class A. That's three of the last four nights. Gad is three of the last four nights. Now, both those guys probably will be available, but it'll be their fourth day pitching in the last five days. Barlow's pitched on back-to-back -back nights. Kate Smith, two of the last three. So Cleveland's bullpen definitely a little bit on the tax side. Uh, so instead of playing Cleveland at, I mean, minus 140, minus 142 isn't even that bad of a price to play them on the full game, but I laid the half run of the first five. I took Cleveland first five run line in this one. Next up, we got Seattle on the road in San Diego. Uh, Padres are favored at home here, minus 135. Total sitting down at seven and a half. We got Bryce Miller on the mound for the Mariners. Michael King getting the start for the Padres. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got a lean on San Diego through the first five innings. Pretty solid lean, actually. 3.11 to 1.81. Final score, solid lean on the Padres. 5.23 to 3.51. So before we get into this one, let's look at some ROI numbers. Uh, on the season, these two teams really close. Padres minus 4%. 
Uh, Mariners are minus 1.7%. Last 10 games, Padres are plus 13.1%, though, and the Mariners close to minus 25%. The fact that this game's in San Diego is significant as well, because uh, the Padres close to a plus 12% ROI on the season at home this year, and the Mariners on the road have been a disaster. Mariners at home have been a great bet, but Mariners on the road minus 19.6% on the season. So the fact that this game's in San Diego should have us leaning towards the Padres before we get started. So let's get started with the numbers here, and we'll start with the Seattle Bats, and it's disgusting. In the last 30 days, this is a bottom five lineup, 29th in OPS. Last 14 days, arguably the worst lineup in baseball. As far as their numbers on the road, I mean, on the season, kind of average. Same goes for the last 30 days. Last 14 days, definitely trending in the wrong direction. And if you take a look at their numbers against right-handed pitching, I mean... Last 14 days, arguably the worst lineup in baseball against righties. Uh, they've been so cold against right-handed pitching. And check this out. The last nine righty starters to pitch against Seattle, 187 ERA and an 094 whip. So this team has not been touching righty starters. And if you pull up the game logs, actually, they were able to get a few runs across on Jose Barrios, four earned runs and six innings pitch. Other than that, though, they didn't touch a single right-handed starter on this list. Yariel Rodriguez is on there. Dean Kramer, who we just found out earlier tonight, is terrible. Uh, so as we know, as I'm sure you've heard if you've been following baseball, uh, Mariners, not a lineup you can trust against righties right now. So will they be able to hit off of Michael King? Uh, well, Michael King on the season, 351 ERA, 127 whip. He's having a great year. Last two starts, 159 and 106. Um, he has been better on the road this year, though. Uh, not that his numbers at home are bad, but 464 ERA and a 138 at home this year. Last six home starts, 378 and a 123. So he's been okay at home. He's just been slightly better on the road. That's all. And if you pull up his game logs, it's looking pretty solid here. I mean, other than June 23rd against the Brewers, uh, 10 base runners and five run runs in six innings. That was a home start. Brewers definitely gave him some problems. Other than that, I mean, all the starts on here are solid. Actually, June 18th on the road in Philadelphia, nine base runners, one earned run, less than five innings of work. That's a bad start as well. Uh, but other than that, the other five starts on this graphic right here are solid. So Michael King really been pitching well. Um, now, something I want to bring up, and this is kind of take it or leave it. He's actually really struggled against bad lineups. On the season against bottom 10 lineups, Michael King, 561 ERA and a 144 whip. So he's actually been really bad when he's seen bad lineups. And the reason I'm bringing this up, Seattle is most definitely a bad lineup right now. So I don't like the look of that for Michael King. Also, struggling against lefty bats. 323 woven and 143 whip against lefties, much worse than his numbers against righties. Seattle's a lefty heavy lineup. One, two, three, four, five, six lefties projected to be in the lineup for the Mariners. So there's another angle I like for the Mariners' bats here. Uh, as far as the pitch mix goes, he throws four pitches almost equally. Sinker, four seam fastball, changeup, and slider all around 25% of the time. Mariners have hit the fastball well in the last 30 days, but the other three, they're bottom five, bottom six in baseball. As a whole, I mean, obviously, Michael King's been pitching really well. The Mariners' bats have been terrible, but I really don't like those righty-lefty splits, and I really don't like that he seems to struggle when he sees bad lineups. So I can't believe I'm even saying this. I think we can expect Seattle to score some runs on them. That sounds crazy even coming out of my mouth. They've been so bad. Um, on the other side, we got this uh, San Diego Bats. Last 30 days, top 10 lineup. Last seven days, maybe slumping a little bit, but I mean, 13th, 14th, and 13th, nothing to take away there. Uh, as far as their numbers at home, last 30 days, top five lineup. So the Padres have definitely been hitting at home in San Diego. When you look at their numbers against right-handed pitching, you can see what I was referencing a little bit. Last 30 days, they're a top 10 lineup against righties, but look at the last seven days, 18 in WRC plus 22nd in OPS 23rd in WOBA so a borderline bottom 10 lineup against righties in the last seven days and check this out the last seven righties to pitch against the Padres 308 ERA and a 108 whip last two 164 ERA so the Padres struggling to get to righty starters and when you pull up the game logs it's I mean it's tough to get a feel for this Ryan Nelson absolutely shut this lineup down pitched almost seven full innings one earned run just four base runners blanked them um, but before that, they were able to give Brandon Fott problems. They got to Slade Ciccioni. Max Scherzer pitched a good game against them. They got to John Gray, got blanked by Evaldi and Winkowski. So kind of hit or miss here. I mean, there's a couple names on this list that they really got to. And then there's a couple they couldn't touch. So I really don't know what to make of that. So what are our thoughts on Bryce Miller? Uh, well, on the season, he's got a 384 ERA and a 108 whip, which are great numbers. Great numbers on the year for Bryce Miller. 
Uh, last four starts up in a 531, 148 whip. Obviously not quite as good. Um, but what's con but the most concerning thing with Bryce Miller this year has been his home away splits. Look at his numbers on the road. 628 ERA on the road this year. Last five road starts, 831. Just cannot stop giving up runs on the road. And the crazy part is his whip on the road looks about the same as his whip at home. So he's not even allowing base runners at a higher rate on the road. Just can't stop allowing runs. So tough to make anything of that. Uh, here are his game logs, and I mean, uh, he pitched against Baltimore, not the greatest start, nine base runners, but I mean, it's Baltimore. Before that, he pitched against a red-hot Twins lineup and actually pitched a great game, six base runners and two earned runs in just five innings. But again, Baltimore, Minnesota, both those starts were at home. Before that, goes on the road in Miami, one of the worst lineups in baseball, and gets crushed. Seven base runners, six earned runs in just four innings. But then before that, on the road in Cleveland, who, that, this is before they started slumping, one of the best lineups in baseball at home, one of the best lineups in baseball against righties, and he pitches a solid game. Just two earned runs and eight base runners. Before that, blank the White Sox. Before that, gets crushed in uh, Kansas City. So just no consistency here. For Bryce Miller. We've seen him look absolutely terrible. He's also looked really good at times. Um, something I don't like for Bryce Miller here is he struggles against lefty bats though. 311 Woba 115 whip. And again, we're mentioning this again. Look at the whip. 115. That's not even bad. He doesn't even allow guys on base at a high rate. It's just the power. Um, the reason I'm bringing up the righty-lefty splits, one, two, three in the Padres order here, all lefties. Um, they have five lefties in the lineup total. So I don't love the look of that for Bryce Miller, but his main pitch is the four-seam fastball. Padres haven't been hitting that pitch 18th in the last 30 days. He also throws a sinker, and the Padres have been terrible against a sinking fastball. So really tough to make a prediction on this side. Padres have been slumping against right-handed starters, but Bryce Miller on the road is really tough to get behind. So I think we can count on San Diego to score some runs on him. As far as the bullpen matchup, no question you got to give it to Seattle here. In the last 30 days, the Mariners are a top 10 bullpen. Padres are a bottom 10. Now, expected fit numbers indicate that the Padres' bullpen has been a bit unlucky, but still, no question, Seattle's got the bullpen edge. Offensively against bullpens, though, this is where you can give the edge back to the Padres. Not that the Mariners' offense has been bad in the late innings. They're pretty average, maybe slightly above average, but the Padres' offense has been a top 10 offense in the late innings. So slight edge offensively uh, to the Padres' offense, but as a whole in the late innings, because the Mariners' bullpen has been so much better, give the edge to Seattle. As far as betting this game, I like the Mariners' here. I like the Mariners to get to Michael King. He's kind of due for a bad start. Struggles against lefty bats. Seattle has a bunch of lefties in the lineup. Maybe the Mariners bats kind of woke up last night. They scored some runs. Um, the problem is I'm terrified of putting my money on Bryce Miller in a road start because those numbers are pretty scary. Um, so I like Seattle in this game, but instead of the money line at the plus 115, I, put, I took Seattle team total over three and a half. Uh, I already bet this. I got it at minus 110. So Seattle team total over here. Next up, we got the Yanks down in Tampa. Uh, this one currently sitting at a pick em. Minus 110s across the board. Total sitting down at eight. We got Marcus Stroman on the mound for the Yanks. Zach Eflin pitching for the Rays. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got a solid lean on Tampa after five innings. 3.26 to 2.56. Solid lean on Tampa final score. Actually, kind of more of a slight lean on Tampa. 5.37 to 4.72. So before we get into this one, let's look at some ROI numbers. Uh, Yankees have been the more profitable team this year, plus 1.4% ROI in the season, raised at minus 8.9%. Neither of these teams have been profitable in the last 10 games, but when you look at Tampa's numbers at home, they actually have been profitable in the last 10, plus 11.2%, and the Yankees on the road, although they have a plus 10.4% on the season, in the last 10 games, they have not been turning a profit uh, so let's get into this one we'll start with the Yankees offense last 30 days still close to being a top 10 lineup but look at the last seven days 20th 20th and 20th as I'm sure you've heard Yankees bats definitely trending in the wrong direction their numbers on the road look fine though in the last I mean on the season top five road lineup last 30 days top 10 road lineup um, their numbers against right-handed pitching actually look okay as well last seven days where we're worried about the Yankees slumping recently 12th 11th and 12th Got to think the numbers might be a little bit skewed by crushing the Red Sox bullpen in that 14-4 win. But still, these numbers look okay. Um, as far as their numbers against right-handed starters, though, maybe gets a little bit concerning. The last four righties to pitch against the Yankees, 284 ERA and a 126 whip. So not really getting to righty starters. But when you pull up the game logs, Cutter Crawford's gem on Sunday Night Baseball is definitely skewing these numbers a bit. Seven shutout innings, just four hits. Other than that, I mean, they got to Winkowski. They got to Tanner Houck. Um, I mean, didn't really get to Frankie Montas. Didn't really get to Graham Ashcraft. Crushed Kevin Gosman. Chris Bassett, six shutout. 
So, I mean, as a whole, definitely not even close to the level they were hitting righty starters a month ago, month and I guess five, six weeks ago. Um, in fact, you probably could make the argument that they're not getting the righty starters. So what do we think about Zach Eflin here? Um, well, I guess you'd have to say his numbers might be a bit disappointing. 419 ERA on the season, 115 whip. Not that that's terrible. It's just not where he was at last year. Uh, his numbers at home still look elite, though. If you remember, he was almost untouchable at home last year. Kind of the same sort of situation this year. On the season, he's got a 243 ERA and an even one whip at home. In his last five home starts, 115 ERA and an 096 whip. So he's been very, very good at home in the trop. Uh, here are his game logs. On the road in Kansas City, got hit up. Before that, home game six shutout. On the road in Pittsburgh, actually, that's a great start in Pittsburgh. He gave up four runs with just six base runners. Uh, got crushed on the road in Atlanta. Before that, a home start, pitched well. Almost pitched six full innings, just two runs against the Cubs. So, you, I mean, it's very clear. Zach Eflin is a guy you can't really rely on on the road, but at home in Tampa, he always seems to show up. Also, we need to mention that Zach Eflin's been really good against the Yankees. Made six career starts against the Yankees. He's 3-1 and one with a 154 ERA and an 094 whip. So he's had no problems pitching against the Yankees. Also, Zach Eflin's got great numbers against lefty bats. 275 Woban, a 107 whip. Definitely better than his numbers against righties. And, I mean, it's not six weeks ago. There's no Stanton in the lineup for the Yankees, which means the Yankees are kind of a lefty-heavy lineup right now. Three of their first four hitters, five, line, uh, five lefties in the lineup total. So I like that for Zach Eflin. Uh, pitch mix-wise, though, he throws a sinker in the cutter. Yankees do have nice numbers against those pitches. He also throws the curveball in the slider, though, and the Yankees have bad numbers against that. Overall, I don't see any reason to doubt Zach Eflin at home. I mean, this is dating back to last year. This guy always seems to show up at home, so I think Zach Eflin pitches a good game here. On the other side, we got the Tampa Bats. Uh, in the last 30 days, slightly above average numbers. In the last seven days, slightly below average numbers. Pretty mediocre across the board here for Tampa. As far as their numbers at home, finally trending in the wrong direction. I mean, the right direction. Um, if you've been watching baseball, you know Tampa's just not been hitting at home this year. In the last 30 days, definitely a bottom 10 lineup at home. But last 14 days, starting to trend the right way. Uh, as far as their numbers against right-handed pitching, not trending the right way, though. Um, the last 30 days, pretty average. But in the last 14 days, they're flirting with the idea of being a bottom five lineup against righties. Um, last 13 righty starters to pitch against the Rays, 274 ERA, 108 whip. Last seven, 261 and an even one. Now here are the game logs and maybe we can cut the Rays a little bit of slack here. There's a lot of good starters on this list. I mean, Eovaldi's having a great year. Lorenzen, eh, I mean, five shutout innings, that's probably a little bit unacceptable. They got to Alec Marsh. Uh, but Michael Waka having a great season. Brady Singer is pretty good this year. Jake Irvin having an elite season. George Kirby having an elite season. So maybe we can cut them a little bit of slack as far as their numbers against right-handed starters because they've definitely seen some tough arms. And Marcus Stroman is definitely not what I consider a tough arm right now. I mean, he's been going through it. In his last six starts, he's got a 574 ERA, 147 whip. He's also been going through it on the road, even though his numbers on the road for the year are great. 254 ERA and a 135 whip on the road this year. Expected FIP 537, indicating he had some good luck. His last two road starts, 675 and a whip above two. Here are his game logs, and I mean, June 22nd was a good start against the Braves. Just five base runners, three earned runs, but... Other than that, the three of his last four starts were bad. And look at the walk numbers. I mean, two, three, two, four. He's having some problems with control right now. Marcus Stroman is not a guy I trust. Um, he's also struggling with lefty bats, and the Rays have a bunch of those. 341 Woban and 137 whip against lefties. 515 expected FIP. Rays are going to have one, two, three, four, five lefties in the lineup. So I don't like that. I also don't like the look of his pitch mix here. Throws the sinker and the cutter. Sinker, cutter, and slider is the three main pitches. Tampa, 8th, 13th, and 4th against those three pitches in the last 30 days. So I don't like the look of that. Um, one thing I can say for Stroman, though, the current Rays bats have bad lifetime numbers against them. 51 career plate appearances. They're hitting just 178 as a team with a 608 OPS. So there's something. If you're looking to back Marcus Stroman, you can say, hey, the current Rays lineup hasn't hit him well in their career. Um, also, the last time Stroman pitched against the Rays, threw a complete game one-hit shutout. Threw a one-hitter. That was in 2023 in Wrigley as a member of the Cubs. 
The weird part is, before that, his last two starts before the Rays, he got completely crushed in both of them. <laughs> um, now, these are in years past with different teams, so probably not relevant. Thought it was interesting enough to include. As far as the bullpen matchup, I mean, flip a coin, man. I, <laughs> the Yankees bullpen, one of the worst in baseball in the last 30 days, but, I mean, the Rays bullpen in the last 30 days is 23rd in ERA, 16th in Woba, so it's not like they've been pitching well. Both these units are pretty bad. Um, offensively against bullpens, again, flip a coin. I mean, pretty much even last 14 days, the Yankees are a top five offense in the late innings, but the Rays are right there, sixth, eighth, and seventh. So uh, the late innings, pretty much a toss up. As far as betting this game, I mean, a little sketched out by the price. I mean, how do you not like Tampa at this price? The Rays have the advantage in almost every single aspect of the game. They have the big starting pitching advantage with Eflin at home. The bats have been better than the Yankees bats. I mean, you could make the argument they even have the bullpen edge. I I don't see how you don't play the Rays at home at minus 110. I haven't bet it yet because I'm a little worried about the price. It seems a little sketchy to me. Um, now, you might be thinking, Kyle, the Rays just won and they used their uh, bullpen arms. And I mean, that's true to an extent, but everyone should be available. I mean, they were very well rested. Fairbanks threw 12 pitches, Adam threw eight pitches. That bullpen's fine. So it's going to be Rays money line at minus 110 or pass for me. I haven't bet this one yet. I'm still this. I, I, I'm a little sketched out about the price, like I said. So Razor Pass. Next up, we got the Dodgers on the road in Philadelphia. Uh, Phillies are favored at home here, minus 130. Total sitting at nine. We got Gavin Stone on the mound for the Dodgers. Christopher Sanchez is getting the star for the Phillies. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got a lean on Philly after five innings, 2.48 to 2.05. Lean on Philly's final score as well. 4.64 to 3.99. So before we get into this one, let's look at some ROI numbers. Uh, Phillies have been the more profitable team on the season, plus 5.9%. Dodgers have minus 6.3%. In the last 10 games, though, neither of these teams have been profitable. Minus 13%, minus 21%. Now, the Phillies have been more profitable at home, plus 10% on the season, but the Dodgers have been more profitable on the road as well. On uh, the last 10 games, betting the Dodgers on the, uh, Dodgers on the road has been profitable, plus 16.7%. So let's get into this one. We'll start with the Dodgers bats. Numbers look solid here. Top five lineup in the last 30 days. Top 10 in the last 14, in the last seven days. So as far as their numbers on the road, best road lineup in baseball this season, first across the board. Last 30 days, top five lineup on the road. Numbers look good there. As far as their numbers against left-handed pitching, also looks great. Top five lineup against lefties in the last 30 days. The last eight lefty starters to pitch against the Dodgers, 568 ERA and a 158 whip. So they've been getting to lefty starters. Now, when you pull up the game logs, they didn't get to Garrett Crochet on June 24th. And the dates are important here. It's important to take note that the Dodgers haven't seen much many left-handed starters recently. I mean, Garrett Crochet was on June 24th before that Patrick Sandoval, and he left the game early. He left the game in the third inning with an injury. Uh, they crushed Ty Block, Austin Gomer, they scored four runs. I mean, we're getting back to mid-June. So the Dodgers have not seen any lefty starters recently. But if you're winding back to mid-June, early June, when they were seeing lefty star starters, for the most part, they were hitting them. Uh, so will they be able to hit Christopher Sanchez? Uh, well, on the season, he's got great numbers. 296 ERA and a 124 whip. Numbers in the last five starts, last two starts, maybe trending in the wrong direction a little bit. But I mean, last five starts, he's still got a 348 to 103. So he's been fine. He's been absolutely dominant at home. Check this out. On the season at home, Christopher Sanchez, 135 ERA, 090 whip. Last six home starts, last three home starts. He's been absolutely excellent. In his last three home starts, he's got an 039 ERA and an 057 whip. This dude has been untouchable at home in Philly. And if you pull up his game logs, I mean, yeah, he got rocked in Wrigley, which was awesome because the Cubs <laughs> was my top bet that night. Um, but before that, seven shutout against the Marlins, three hits. Before that, seven shutout against the D-backs, three hits. Seven innings, seven base runners, just Warner and run against the Padres. I mean, his home starts on this graphic right here are absolutely dominant. He's truly been excellent at home recently. Uh, he's also been really good against top 10 lineups. 18 and two-thirds innings against top 10 lineups versus lefties. Now, that is something to take note of. He's thrown significantly more innings pitch against bottom 10 lineups than top 10 lineups. So maybe a little bit of a fortunate, uh, fortunate schedule so far for Christopher Sanchez. But even when he's seen top 10 lineups, 145 ERA and an 096 whip. So he's pitched great when he's seen top 10 lineups. And I think we can all agree the Dodgers are a top 10 lineup. As far as righty-lefty splits, he definitely has better looking numbers against lefty bats. Um, against righties, 293 Woba and a 131 whip. So not terrible, but definitely a little bit more vulnerable. And the Dodgers probably will have seven righties in the lineup. 
but that's not really uncommon for a lefty starter for the most part if you're a lefty starter you're going to be pitching against at least six seven righties every single game so it's not really uncommon there uh, as far as his pitch mix he throws the sinker and the changeup most dodgers seventh and 14th against those two pitches in the last 30 days so as a whole on this side tough to fade the dodgers lineup against a lefty because for the most part they've hit most of the lefty starters they've seen but they haven't seen a lefty in over two weeks christopher sanchez at home's been untouchable i think we can count on him here i think christopher sanchez can throw a good game um, on the other side, we got the Phillies bats, and these numbers are tough because, as we know, they just played a chunk of games without their two best hitters, Schwarber and, and uh, Bryce Harper, who are now both back. Um, so, yeah, in the last 14 days, last seven days, they're a bottom 10 lineup, but there's a big chunk of, of the games missing their two best hitters. As far as their numbers at home, I mean, we know this is a great lineup at home. In the last 30 days, top three lineup at home. In the last 14 days, you're going to get a chunk missing those two hitters. As far as their numbers against right-handed pitching, again, we might need to just disregard these. Um, in the last 30 days, they're a top 10 lineup against righties. Last seven days down at 28th, but Schwarber and Harper are back. Same goes for the numbers against righty starters. I mean, the last four righty starters to pitch against the Phillies, 231 ERA and a 111 whip. But we just saw them absolutely butcher <laughs> uh, Bobby Miller tonight. I mean, they scored like nine runs off him or something. So now that those two guys are back in the lineup, we could pretty much disregard all of this. And if you look at the game logs, rewind back to June 24th, Casey Mize. That's when those guys were in the lineup. And if you scroll back farther than that, they were getting to righty starters. So now that those two guys are back, uh, the Phillies are definitely a lineup I would trust against righties again like they were earlier in the season. Um, now, Gavin Stone's on the mound. He did pitch against the Phillies last year on May 3rd, got hit up. Eight hits in four and runs and just four innings of work. But Gavin Stone last year wasn't nearly the same Gavin Stone that we've seen this year. I mean, he's having an excellent season. 303 ERA and a 120 whip on the season. Last four starts, 333 and a 107. Uh, his numbers on the road look elite on the season. 230 ERA and a 102 whip on the road. Even better than that in his last four road starts. 133 whip, uh, 133 ERA and an 085 whip. So Christopher Sanchez has been untouchable at home. Well, Gavin Stone on the road has been basically the same thing. Look at his game logs. I mean, he just got crushed by Arizona. They are tattooing righty starters right now, though. Before that, nine a complete game shutout against the White Sox. Actually pitched a good game on the road in Coors Field. Pitched solid against the Royals. Struggled in Yankee Stadium, but that was back in early June when the Yankees were still hitting. Five shutout innings against the Rockies. Seven shutout innings against the Mets. Gavin Stone's having a great year. Absolutely excellent year. Uh, he's also been pretty good against top 10 lineups as well. You can see he's definitely been better when he's pitched against bad lineups, but look at his numbers against top 10 lineups, 293 ERA and a 130 whip. So when he's seen top 10 lineups, he still has been able to perform well. But I am a little bit worried about this 139 whip against left-handed bats, 459 expected FIP against lefty bats, because now that Schwarber and Harper are back, the Phillies become a dangerous lefty heavy lineup again. Um, this projected lineup has five lefties in the lineup for the Phillies, but we've seen them as with as many as six, even seven sometimes. So now that these two guys are back, the Phillies have a ton of dangerous left-handed bats to use. Don't like the look of that for Gavin Stone. Now, if you look at his pitch mix, he throws the four-seam fastball, the changeup, and the sinker. Phillies have pretty shitty numbers against the changeup and the four-seam fastball, but they're the best lineup in baseball against the sinker in the last 30 days. And again... In the last 30 days, these are going to include the games without Schwarber and Harper. So we need to take these numbers with a little, little bit of a grain of salt. Personally, I think the Phillies get to Gavin Stone. And I've made money betting Gavin Stone this year, but uh, I, on the road in Philly with Schwarber and Harper back, I don't want to fade these bats. So I, I think the Phillies are able to score runs on Gavin Stone here. As far as the bullpen matchup, no question. Edge goes to the Phillies here. On the last 30 days, Phillies bullpen, 6th in ERA, 6th in, uh, in Woba. Dodgers bullpen in that same span, 13th and 18th. So Phillies bullpen has definitely outperformed the Dodgers bullpen. Offensively against bullpens, though, this is where you give the edge back to the Dodgers. On the last 30 days, the Dodgers are a top 10 lineup in the late innings. Phillies are 20th in WRC+, 19th in OPS, 18th in Woba in that span. But still, because of the significant uh, difference in bullpens here, I'd give the edge to the Phillies in the late innings. As far as betting this game, it would only be the Phillies for me here. Um, with those two guys back in the lineup, no question they've outproduced the Dodgers this season. Christopher Sanchez at home has been almost untouchable. Uh, so the only way I'd go here is Phillies money line. I'm a little worried about fading the Dodgers at plus money with Gavin Stone on the mound on the road where he's been so good. 
Um, so I actually haven't bet it yet, but it would only be Phillies as far as a side. But if you are looking for a hitter prop in this one, look at Will Smith and Teoscar Hernandez. Look at their expected Woba and barrel rate numbers against Christopher San against lefties with Christopher Sanchez's pitch mix. 20.85% and 24.15%. So they see his pitch mix really well. Um, so if you are looking for a hitter prop in this one, maybe one of those two guys. Next up, we got Oakland on the road in Boston. Uh, Sox are favored at home here, minus 190. Total sitting at nine and a half. We got J.P. Sears on the mound for Oakland. Nick Pavetta pitching for the Sox. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got to lean on Boston after five innings, 3.46 to 2.87. Lean on Boston final score as well, 5.65 to 4.79. So before we get into this one, let's look at some ROI numbers. Uh, no question, Boston's been the more profitable team here, plus 5.7% on the season, Oakland minus 10.5%. But in the last 10 games, these two teams both have been profitable, plus 8.3%, plus 7.8%. So pretty even in the last 10 games um, now we know boston's been much more profitable at home uh, on the road this year in fact they're the most profitable road team in baseball but in the last 10 games they've been turning a profit at home and oakland on the road has been an absolute disaster minus 23.1 percent on the season minus 75.3 percent in the last 10 games so betting oakland on the road has been a death sentence this season and as of late um, so let's get into this one we'll start with the oakland bats as we were talking about yesterday trending in the right direction on um, last 30 days pretty average but in the last seven days oakland's got top five numbers oakland's been hitting man they really came alive in that six game homestand and then they scored some runs tonight i mean boston scored way more but oakland oakland's bats were active again tonight uh, as far as their numbers on the road we know this is a bottom five road lineup this year uh, but last 30 days last 14 days maybe starting to trend in the right direction uh, as far as their numbers against right-handed pitching, again, last seven days, I mean, 11th, 12th, and 11th. So Oakland definitely trending the right direction here. Um, last 16 righty starters to pitch against Oakland, 412 ERA and a 112 whip. Last three righty starters, 506 ERA, but still an even one whip. So they haven't really been getting to righty starters. And when you look at the game logs, it's pretty ugly here. I mean, they got to Jose Soriano on July 2nd. But that was his first start back from injury. So I'm not sure how much weight I even put into that. Other than that one, I mean, Grayson Rodriguez, Albert Suarez, Brandon Fott, Zach Allen, all pitched great games against Oakland. They did get to Slade Ciccioni back on June 28th, but then got blanked by Griffin Canning before that. So as a whole, not really getting to righty starters here. Lefty starters is a different story. They've been crushing lefty starters, but definitely not getting to righty starters. So the question becomes, will they get to Nick Pavetta? Uh, well, I mean, he was having so his numbers are crazy. So check this out. On the season, 406 ERA, 114 whip. Not bad at all. Last five starts, 513 ERA, 144 whip. Eh, not great. Uh, his numbers at home, though. Last five home starts, 608 ERA, 152. Last two home starts, an ERA above 10. Now, when we pull up his game logs, check this out. So, if you remember, we rewind back to early June, Nick Pavetta was looking untouchable. And you can see here, the June 5th start against Atlanta. That's a, when it ended. Through seven shutout innings, just three base runners against the Braves. Before that, pitched a great game against the Tigers. And it, it stretches back before that. Nick, Nick Pavetta was dealing, but then four ugly starts in a row. <laughs> Phillies, Blue Jays, Reds, Padres all hit him up. He looked bad in all of them. So I took the Marlins on July 4th. I was like, yo, Pavetta's four bad starts in a row. Then he shows up and is untouchable. Seven shutout innings, just three base runners against the Marlins on the 4th of July. Uh, so is he back? I mean, tough to say. It is the Marlins. And that kind of brings us to the next graphic here. When he's seen bad lineups, he's been dominant. He's thrown 33 and a third innings pitch against bottom 10 lineups this year. He's got a 216 ERA and an 084 whip in those innings. So he's been really good when he's seen bottom 10 lineups. And I think we can all agree, yeah, they might have been on a little bit of a hot streak. But as a whole, I think we'd all agree Oakland's a bottom 10 lineup. So I like that for Pavetta. I don't like how he struggles against righty bats, though. 342 Wobin and 122 whip against righties. Definitely worse than his numbers against lefties. Oakland, a very righty-heavy lineup. Six righties projected to be in the lineup for the A's. Now, I mean, that wouldn't scare me off backing Pavetta, but it's definitely not something I like here uh, that he struggles against righties. Uh, pitch mix-wise, though, Oakland's been really bad against the four-seam fastball, and Pavetta throws it 49% of the time. So you like to see that, but his secondary pitch is the slider and Oakland's actually been a top five lineup against the slider. So kind of a mixed bag here in the handicap so far, but then we get to Pavetta's history against Oakland and I think the picture becomes a little clearer. He's absolutely dominated this team. Through four starts against the Athletics, he's 4-0 with an 033 ERA and an 070 whip. So he has had 
no problems and i mean no problems pitching against oakland absolutely dominant numbers and check this out the current oakland lineup 33 career plate appearance against Pavetta, which admittedly is a super small sample size, but just a 415 OPS and a strikeout rate above 36%. So this lineup's really struggled lifetime against Pavetta, and he's had no problems pitching against Oakland. So even though backing Pavetta at home in Fenway is not something I like to make a habit of, that's dating back multiple years he struggles in Fenway, but I like him to deal here. I think he pitches a good game. On the other side, we got the Bastin Bats. On the last 30 days, top 10 lineup. But as we talked about on the live show, definitely trending the wrong way here. Below average in the last 14 days, the last seven days. As far as their numbers at home in Fenway, again, trending in the wrong direction. In the beginning of the season, they couldn't hit at all at home. Then they got hot and they were hitting at Fenway. And now it seems to be trending the wrong way again. So the bats haven't been crazy active at home. Um, now we get to their numbers against left-handed pitching, and this is very interesting. So in the last 30 days, pretty mediocre numbers, but the last 14 days, last seven days, Boston's the worst lineup in baseball against lefties, which, I mean, last 14 days, last seven days is an insanely small sample size to look at numbers against left-handed pitching, because how many at-bats are you even talking about with a small sample size like that? So why don't we look at the lefty starters? The last three lefty starters are pitching against Boston, 395 ERA and a 154 whip pretty mediocre numbers when we pull up the game logs it starts to make a little more sense in the last 14 days they're the worst lineup in baseball against left-handed pitching they've only seen two lefties in that span and they actually got to trevor rogers eight base runners and two earned runs and just three innings of work yeah nestor cortez blanked them so <laughs> they didn't get the nestor cortez tough to make a prediction based off that because obviously we're not going to sit here and say those at bats against lefty bullpen arms don't matter but how much do we weigh that in to overall prediction because if you're winding back to june mid-june into early june they were getting to lefty starters but that's a month ago now so I, I don't know how much weight we put into this stuff um and jp sears is coming off back-to-back -back good starts 245 ERA and an 082 whip in his last two starts. Now, his last five starts look pretty awful. 748 ERA and a 189 whip. Also, he hasn't been good on the road. In his last six road starts, he's got a 540 ERA and a 158 whip. In his last three road starts, even worse than that. So don't like the look of that. When we pull up his game logs, I mean, he did just pitch a gem on July 4th against the Angels. He also, right before that, great game against Arizona in Arizona, which is a tough place to pitch. He got absolutely slaughtered in back-to-back -back starts by the Twins, and I mean bad. Before that, the Padres hit him up. But then before that, we're seeing a couple, I mean, six innings pitched, two earned runs against the Mariners, seven innings on the road in Atlanta is solid. So I think those Twins games right there, June 22nd, June 16th, are definitely skewing J.P. Sears' numbers a bit. Because if you're looking at his game logs, it doesn't look that bad. And if you pull up his splits against top 10 and bottom 10 lineups, now admittedly, this is very thin, but he's actually got great numbers against bottom 10 lineups versus lefties. 274 ERA and an 096 whip. Boston in the last 14 days, worst lineup in baseball against lefties, 30th. Now again, it's kind of a little bit tongue in cheek there because we know Boston is not the worst lineup in baseball against lefties lefties they've only seen two lefty starters in that span so uh, interesting enough to mention in the video not sure how much weight it carries now another thing i like here for jp sears one of his biggest weaknesses is pitching to right-handed bats which as a lefty starter is not a good weakness to have but against boston i mean their main bat i mean duran devers a couple of their main pieces are lefties and even against left-handed pitching you'll still see them rock four lefties in the lineup which J.P. Sears only pitching to five righties. That's way lower than he's used to. So I actually kind of like that. He's pitched well against lefty bats. Now, when you get to his pitch mix, it's a little concerning. He throws the slider, the four-seam fastball, and the changeup. Boston six and first against the slider and the changeup, but they've struggled with the fastball. So eh, take it or leave it there. As far as J.P. Sears' history against Boston, he pitched against him on July 9th of last year. So, wow, literally a year ago to the day when I'm recording this right now. Um, five innings pitched, just one run, two hits, three walks. So he pitched great against them last year. But we know Boston's lineup this year is different than last year. So I'm not sure how much weight that carries either. Overall on this side, it's definitely tough to back J.P. Sears on the road in Fenway. But I do think he's going to pitch well. I think J.P. Sears will be okay here. Um, as far as the bullpen matchup, Boston the last 30 days, ninth in ERA, ninth in WOBA, but they're 21st in expected fit, indicating they've had some good luck. Doesn't matter because the Oakland bullpen, which was so good a month and a half, two months ago, it's fallen off a cliff. It's actually one of the worst bull bullpens in baseball in the last two weeks. So bullpen edge definitely goes to Boston, even though they've also been struggling. Offensively against bullpens though, 
Oakland by a mile. In the last 14 days, Oakland's a top 10 lineup, top five lineup in the in the late inning so that evens things up i would say this is a wash in the late innings as far as betting this game i took the under in this one and i'm a little hesitant um on pulling the trigger on some of these unders because i just lost so many unders earlier tonight um but i like this at nine and a half i got it at minus 102 i think it's a good bet a little bit of a buy low spot in nick pavetta who has shaky numbers as of late but he's been really dominant when he's seen bad lineups like oakland and i actually expect to see a somewhat decent game out of jp sears all the way up at nine and a half juice to the over um, so yeah, I got the under at nine and a half. Next up, we got the Nats on the road in City Field to play the Mets. Mets pretty heavily favored at home here, minus 200. Total sitting at nine and a half. We got Patrick Corbin on the mound for the Nats. It's Corbin Day. Uh, Luis Severino pitching for the Mets. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got a slight lean on Washington through five innings, 3.08 to 3.07. So pretty much deadlocked. Slight lean on the Mets final score. 5.13 to 4.89. So before we get into this one, let's look at some ROI numbers. Uh, Washington's been more profitable than the Mets this year, plus 6.2% on the season. Mets minus 1.3%, so pretty much just below zero. Um, as far as the Mets at home, last 10 days have been profitable, plus 48.2%. But as a whole, Mets have been a much better bet on the road this year. Meanwhile, the Nats plus 12.2% on the road, but last 10 games, last five games, Nats have not been profitable on the road. So let's get into this one. We'll start with the Nats bats um, looking OK. Last 30 days, slightly above average numbers, 14th in WRC plus 12th in OPS, 13th in Woba. Last seven days, the Nats have top 10 offensive numbers. So let's give the Nats some credit. Um, numbers on the road. Last 30 days, 12th, 12th, 13th and 12th. Last 14 days don't look great, but that's a crazy small sample size to look at home away splits. Um, as far as their numbers against right into pitching, again, looking pretty solid. Top half lineup against righties in the last 30 days. In the last seven days, the Nats have been a top five lineup against right into pitching. So you love to see it. The last seven righty starters to pitch against the Nats, an even uh, even six ERA, 172 whip. Last four righty starters, 853 ERA and a 205 whip. So the Nats have been getting to righty starters. And when you pull up the game logs, I mean, this looks pretty impressive. They didn't touch Michaelis, which, thank you, because the, Car the Cardinals were my top bet that day. Um, but before that, they got to Kyle Gibson, Lance Lynn, Sonny Gray, Christian Scott. Four righties in a row. The Nats got to. So maybe this Nationals lineup, I mean, it is a lineup full of lefty bats. It wouldn't be crazy that this Nats lineup is getting hot against righties. Maybe they're starting to heat up. Now, we do have to mention that the Nationals have really struggled to hit Luis Severino in the past. Uh, he's made two career starts against Washington. He's got an 061 ERA and an 068 whip in those two starts. Both were within the last two seasons, by the way. So we're not talking about four or five years ago. Uh, but Severino kind of trending in the wrong direction here. On the season, he's got great numbers. 383 ERA, 120 whip. Last five starts, ERA's up at 517. Last two starts up at 762. Um, his numbers at home still look solid, though. 282 ERA and a 120 whip at home. Last five home starts, last two home starts looking solid. Uh, expected FIP numbers indicate he had a little bit of good luck, but still, Severino at home's been pretty good. Uh, if you take a look at his game logs, he did struggle on the road in Pittsburgh. He got crushed. Um, before that, though, at home, I know you see the four the four earned runs to Houston. He pitched seven innings and only allowed nine base runners. That's a solid start there. Before that, a great start at Wrigley. Got crushed by the Rangers. Before that, great uh, not even a great start at home in the Marlins. Ten base runners in six innings pitch. Just one run, though. Then you get to June 5th against this Nationals team, and, I mean, he was great. Eight innings pitched, just one earned run, seven hits. So he pitched great against Washington back in early June. But as we just looked at, Washington seems to be getting to righty starters better right now than they were a month ago. I definitely don't like that Severino has shaky splits against lefty bats. 324 Woban, a 132 whip against lefties. Nats, as we know, very lefty heavy lineup. In fact, five of the first six hitters in this Nationals lineup are lefties. Definitely don't like that for Severino. Also, his pitch mix, his two main pitches, the four-seam fastball and the sinker. Nationals are a top 10 lineup against both those pitches in the last 30 days. So I know Severino has pitched really well against this Nationals lineup. I know the Nationals are not a lineup you really trust on the road. I expect Washington to hit Luis Severino in this one. I think the Nats are going to score some runs. On the other side, we got the Mets lineup. And I mean... <laughs> This is so Mets. I mean, in the last 30 days, top five lineup in baseball. In the last seven days, bottom three lineup in baseball. Uh, welcome to Mets ball, man. <laughs> it's, it's tough. I'm a Mets fan, for those of you who don't know. Um, as far as the Mets numbers at home, the last 30 days, they're a top three home lineup, which is huge because earlier in the season, they were really struggling to hit at City Field. 
Uh, lately, they've been hitting at home, though. Their numbers against left-handed pitching look great. Uh, in the last 30 days, they're a top three lineup in baseball against lefties. Last 14 days, last seven days look great. Um, their numbers against lefty starters, not quite as great, though. The last four lefties to pitch against the Mets, 466 ERA and a 119 whip. Uh, last two of an even nine ERA, though. When you pull up the game logs, I mean, yeah, they got to Bailey. Well, they hit the shit at a Bailey Falter. Uh, but before that, Mitchell Parker, they scored five runs. They only had five hits. He, made, he pitched six innings. And then they didn't touch DJ Hurst, didn't touch Mackenzie Gore. And then you get back into late June when the Grimace era, we'll call it. And they were absolutely smacking lefty starters. But I don't know if I trust this lineup, this Mets lineup, like I did in late June. That national series kind of killed the Mets' offensive momentum. I mean, they saw three lefty starters in a row, didn't really get to them. And they really haven't been the same since. Uh, but now we have to ask, will they get to Patrick Corbin? Um, historically, they always hit Corbin. He's made nine starts since 2022 against the Mets. He's 3-5 and five with a 670 ERA and a 155 whip. So he's struggled against, against the Mets in recent years. Um, Patrick Corbin as a whole has been okay, though. In his last four starts, he's got a 430 ERA and a 122 whip. 373 expected FIP. You'll take that from Corbin. That's not bad at all. As far as his numbers on the road, again, I mean, not bad at all. In his last four road starts, 370 ERA and a 119 whip. So Patrick Corbin's been pretty solid. I mean, it's it's Corbin. You're not going to get elite numbers out of him. But he's re he really hasn't been bad at all. Uh, here are his game logs. He did struggle in his last start against the Cardinals. Before that, I mean, the Rays got to him four earned runs, but he did pitch six innings into the game. Pitched a great game against the Padres, Diamondbacks, Tigers before that. And then before that is June 5th, and the Mets got to him. Six earned runs, eight base runners, and five and a third. Corbin also has a worse Woba against righty bats, 381. Uh, whip looks about the same as lefties, though. 152 whip compared to a 150. It's actually slightly better against righties. Uh, Mets are going to be loaded up with righties in this one. Brandon Nimmo, only, the only projected lefty in the lineup. So not a great look for Corbin there. Uh, I do like the pitch mix numbers, though. He throws the sinker, and the sinker, the slider, and the cutter. Mets 20th, 10th, and 21st against those three pitches in the last 30 days. Look, I mean, as far as making a prediction here, I'm <laughs> by no means am I saying Patrick Corbin's going to go on the road in City Field and throw a gem. But I don't think the Mets are going to absolutely slaughter him. I think we can count on Corbin to give you five innings pitch, three earned runs, somewhere in that range. As far as the bullpen matchup in this one, it's pretty even. I mean, the Mets' bullpen has just fallen off a cliff. Now that Diaz is back, maybe they start to trend upwards. But based on the production from the last couple of weeks, I guess slight edge to the Nats. But neither of these units are very good. Uh, and offensively, against bullpens, you got to give the edge to the Nats. I mean, in the last seven days, the Nats are trending upwards. Look at the Mets. Yeah, rewind two weeks ago, the Mets were hitting in the late innings, but they haven't been recently. So overall edge in the late innings, I give to Washington here. As far as betting this game, I want to take the Nats here bad. I want to play that plus 160. Huge plus number against a Mets team that hasn't been hitting. The bullpen's in shambles. Even last night, they were up 6 nothing. had the game in the bag. They still had to use their main arms because they almost blew it. I mean... This Mets team cannot be trusted in the late innings. So even if Severino is able to pitch a good game, which I think the Nats are going to get to him. They've been getting to righty starters. But even if Severino is able to pitch a good game, Nats team total over three and a half should still be live. And by the way, spoilers, that's what I'm on. On the Nats team total over three and a half, I would love to play the Nats money line, but Patrick Corbin on the road in City Field. The Mets always seem to smack him around. Um, so I personally took Nationals team total over three and a half. Not mad at a full game total at nine, a full game over at nine or nine and a half also. Uh, but I feel more comfortable in Washington team total over here. Next up, we got Colorado on the road in Cincinnati. Uh, Reds are pretty heavily favored here. Minus 180 at home. Total sitting at nine and a half. We got Kyle Freeland getting the start for the Rockies. Frankie Montas pitching for the Reds. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. According to the model, we got a slight lean on the Reds after five innings. 3.05 to 2.50. Uh, solid, solid lean on the Reds final score. 5.14 to 3.85 Cincinnati. So before we get into this one, let's look at some ROI numbers. Uh, Cincinnati has been a more profitable team on the season minus 4.9 percent Rockies are minus 11 percent uh, in the last 10 games both of these teams have been turning a profit though plus 19.6 percent for the Rockies plus 14.2 percent from the Reds but both are not in their desired location because the Reds at home have been a nightmare minus 16.6 percent on the season even worse than that in the last 10 games last five games Rockies on the road even worse minus 22.7 percent one of the worst uh one of the least profitable road teams in baseball this year so let's get into this match matchup uh and actually i'm just gonna play a clip from last night's video because i thought frankie montas was pitching tonight so i already did this handicap frankie montas against the rockies bats it's the exactly the same so i'm just gonna play it rockies bats i mean in the last 30 days they're 13th in ops 
but obviously those numbers are skewed because they played in uh, playing Coors Field. If you look at WRC Plus, which is an adjusted metric that takes into account ballpark, they're 27th in the last 14 days, one of the worst lineups in baseball. Um, we look at their numbers on the road, and we already know this is one of the worst, if not the worst, road lineup in baseball. On the season, 29th, 29th, 29th. Last 30 days, bottom three lineup on the road in baseball. As far as their numbers against righties, I mean, there is maybe a light at the end of the tunnel here. In the last 14 days, they're one of the worst lineups in baseball against righties, but look at the last seven days. 10th, 9th, and 9th. So, okay, I mean, it's seven days. Can't really draw anything from that, but the Rockies have been hitting. Uh, and if you look at their numbers against righty starters... Last seven righty starters to pitch against the Rockies, 346 ERA, 098 whip. Last two, 450 and 133. Eh, nothing really to take away there. Uh, here are the game logs. They did get to Tobias Myers and Bryce Wilson. Got to give them that. But the other five righty starters on this list, they did not get to. Seth Lugo, Colin Rea, Jonathan Cannon, Andrew Thorpe, Spencer Aragetti. Um, and these are not exactly Cy Young candidates. Seth Lugo's having a great season. Other than that, those are not righties that should be blanking you, and they had no problems pitching against the Rockies. So as a whole, I don't think this lineup is very good. I don't care what the numbers say in the last seven days, which brings us to Frankie Montas. And why do we start with the fact that he blanked this team in Coors Field? Back on June 4th, Frankie Montas went into Coors Field, seven shutout innings, just one hit. I should know. I had the over in that game. Wasn't even close. Frankie Montas threw an absolute gem, arguably his best start of the season. Um, and Frankie Montas has been pretty good recently. His last three starts, 265 ERA, 106 whip. Now the 476 expected FIP indicates that he may have had some good luck, but still Frankie Montes has definitely been pitching well. Now, if you pull up his home numbers, this looks pretty shaky. His last two home starts, 736 ERA. His last five home starts, 497 ERA. So definitely don't love the look of, uh, the look of that for Frankie Montas. But then you pull up the game logs. Where are these ugly home starts? I only see one and it's June 9th against the Cubs. He got crushed. Five hits, three walks, four earned runs in just an inning and a third. That's skewing all the numbers here. Because if you look at the other six starts on his game logs here, they're all solid. Some of them are excellent. Solid start on the road in Yankee Stadium. Gem on the road in St. Louis. Solid start on the road in, I mean, that's at home versus Boston. Solid start on the road in Milwaukee. Great start in Colorado. Solid start home against St. Louis. So it's really just one bad start that are that's skewing the numbers here for Frankie Montas. He's been pitching well. As far as righty-lefty splits, he's definitely been having problems with lefty bats this year, no question. 365 Woban and 155 whip against lefties. Much, much worse than his numbers against righties. And the Rockies do have five lefties projected to be in the lineup here, but three of them are the seven, eight, and nine hitters. Uh, Nolan Jones, Togley, and Jake Cave. Only two of their first six hitters are lefties, Charlie Blackman and Ryan McMahon. So the main pieces of this Rockies lineup are mostly righties. So I'm not too scared of these le uh, righty lefty splits, although it is a concern. Um, as far as his pitch mix, he throws the four seam fastball, the splitter, and the cutter. Rockies actually have okay numbers against the splitter and the cutter. They're pretty average. Uh, 22nd against the fastball in the last 30 days, though. As a whole, it's it's one ugly start against the Cubs that are skewing all his numbers. I think Frankie Montes has been pitching pretty well. I think he pitches well, pretty well here um, against a Rockies lineup that I don't think is any good. They're certainly bad on the road. So I like the spot for Frankie Montas. So I think Frankie Montas is going to pitch well. Uh, on the other side, we got the Cincinnati Bats and it's terrible. I mean, bottom five lineup in the last 30 days, bottom five lineup in the last 14 days. As far as their numbers at home, just as bad, if not worse. In the last 30 days, this is one of the worst home lineups in baseball. 29th in WRC+, plus, 28th in OPS, 28th in WOBA. As far as their numbers against left-handed pitching, just as bad. I mean, the last 30 days, this is a bottom six, bottom seven lineup in baseball against lefties, so they're not getting to lefties. Uh, the last seven lefty starters, seven, to pitch against the Reds combined for a 312 ERA and an 097 whip. So yeah, not getting to lefty starters. When you pull up the game logs, I mean, didn't get to Scooble, didn't get to Radon. They got to Bailey Falter the second time, but a little bit of an unfair advantage there. They just saw him six days prior. Uh, so even that one has an asterisk next to it. And if you take out that one June 24th game against Bailey Falter, I mean, they're not getting to lefty starters at all. And they also haven't seen a ton. So I don't have much faith in this Reds lineup getting to lefties. And by the way, Kyle Freeland <laughs> somehow has been pitching great. In his last three starts, a 137 ERA and an 097 whip. 426 expected FIP indicates he's had some good luck, but still, let's give Kyle Freeland some credit, man. He's been dealing. Uh, not so much on the road, though. 
on the season kyle freeland has an 1194 era and a 237 whip on the road you definitely don't love to see that um, but when you pull up his game logs i mean you got to give kyle freeland some credit here i mean his last start july 5th great start against the royals seven innings just one run before that solid start on the road in chicago almost pitched seven full innings just two runs nine base runners that's not too bad um, before that gem against the nationals six shutout innings just two base runners so three starts in a row where kyle freeland has looked pretty good um now he does have some pretty ugly looking splits against righty bats this year and cincinnati's probably gonna have nine righties in the lineup 371 woven a 170 whip definitely a little shaky i will say these ugly numbers probably come from earlier in the season when he was getting crushed take him with a grain of salt but yeah you, you don't love to see that uh, pitch mix wise I like what I'm seeing though for Freeland he throws a four seam fastball the sinker and the slider the Reds are 21st 15th and 21st against those three pitches in the last 30 days so that's a solid look for Freeland also he's pitched really well against this team since 2022 he's pitched twice against the Reds he's 1-0 with a 142 ERA and a 110 whip so Kyle Freeland has not had problems with the Reds in the past as a whole on this side I mean I think Kyle Freeland's gonna pitch well I know trusting Kyle Freeland on the road is crazy, but the Reds have been so bad at home. I'm not going to let one game trick me into trying to trust this Reds lineup at home. We've just seen three consecutive good starts from Kyle Freeland. He has great history against this team. I think Kyle Freeland will pitch well. I'm not expecting a gem, but I think we can get a quality start out of Kyle Freeland in this one. Uh, as far as the bullpen matchup, no question it's Reds and it's not close. In the last 30 days, the Reds are a top 10 bullpen. Rockies in the last 30 days, arguably the worst bullpen in baseball. I will say the Reds bullpen is tailing off a bit as of late, but still no question Reds have the bullpen advantage here. Uh, offensively against bullpens though, I guess slight lean towards Rockies but it's really only because the Reds have been so terrible in the last 30 days Cincinnati is the worst lineup in baseball in the late innings 30th in WRC plus 30th in OPS so based on that alone I guess you give the slight edge to the Rockies bats but as a whole in the late innings Reds have the advantage because their bullpen has just been so much better as far as betting this game I want to take the under again uh, I've played the under in both games of this series I took it the first one and hit took it earlier tonight and lost um, so I'm a little hesitant because I just took a loss taking the under in this series just a few hours ago and it wasn't even close. It went way over. Um, but to be fair, when I first wrote the under down on last night's game or earlier tonight's game, I thought Frankie Montes was going to be pitching. And then I found out it was Nick Lodolo and I was still like, oh, screw it. I still like the under. I'll bet it um, when I probably should have went back to the drawing board. And I'm not making an excuse or anything, but... The point I'm making is I originally liked this under, that under that I just lost on. I originally liked that bet based on my thoughts that Frankie Montas would deal. So here we have Frankie Montas actually getting the start now. I think he deals. The reason I'm ultimately probably going to stay off this is the Reds bullpen. They ended up having to use some arms tonight. I mean, they won 12 to 6. So it looks like they won via blowout, but that really wasn't the case. It was 7 6, and the Reds were forced to use a couple of their high leverage arms. Cruz probably isn't going to be available. Nick Martinez has thrown two of the last three. Uh, so I could see the Rockies scoring some runs late and screwing me here. I like the under, but probably going to pass. Next up, we got Miami on the road in Houston. Um, it's Brian Honig against Framber Valdez as the pitching matchup. We don't have a ton of data on Brian Honig, so I actually skipped that game, uh, which brings us right along to Pittsburgh on the road in Milwaukee. Brewers are favored at home here, minus 155. Total sitting at eight and a half. We got Martin Perez pitching for the Pirates. Tobias Myers on the mound for the Brewers. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. According to the model, we got to lean on Milwaukee after five innings, 3.25 to 2.6. Final score leaning towards Milwaukee as well, 5.34 to 4.54. So before we get into this matchup, let's start with some ROI numbers. Uh, Milwaukee definitely been the more profitable team here, plus 9.8% on the season. Pirates minus 7.7%. In the last 10 games, though, neither of these teams have been turning a profit, though. The fact that this game's in Milwaukee is significant, though, because the Brewers have been very profitable at home this year. I believe they're top three or top five most profitable home teams in baseball, plus 17.5% ROI on the season. Pirates minus 3.8% on the road. So they have haven't been a bad road team to back this year but brewers at home have been pretty money so the fact that this game's in milwaukee is huge let's get into this one and we'll start with the pirates bats last 30 days bottom 10 lineup but if you look at the last 14 days the last seven days it looks like the pirates bats are heating up and they are to some extent but before we get into this one we need to take note that these numbers are a bit skewed because they hit a ton of home runs against the mets bullpen in one single blowout game so it's definitely skewing the numbers a bit, and you'll see it as we go through it. But let's give the Pirates some credit. They're definitely doing a better job hitting uh, hitting the baseball in the last 14 days, top half lineup. Uh, as far as their numbers on the road, 
in the last 30 days, 16th, 16th, and 16th. So if you're a Pirates fan, you'll take that. An average road lineup in the last 30 days. When you get the numbers against right-handed pitching, again, I mean, they look great. Top five lineup in the last 14 days against righties. Top 10 in the last seven. But it, keep in mind, these numbers are a bit skewed. Because if you look at their numbers specifically against righty starters, I mean, the last three righty starters to pitch against the Pirates, 482 ERA, 096 whip, 096. Uh, so the whip is not good. They're getting some runs across. They've hit some home runs here and there, but uh, not getting guys on base. And if you pull up the game logs, you could see, I mean, Pirates top five lineup against righties in the last 14 days. Where? <laughs> Here are the righty starters they've seen. They crushed Severino. And then that one game, I think it was the July 8th game, they crushed the Mets bullpen. They hit like seven home runs or something. Actually, Andy in the office read us a tweet. In that one game, the Pirates were 27th in the MLB in home runs entering it. And after the game, they were 16th from one game. I, I mean, I don't know if those are the exact numbers, but it was something crazy like that. But the point is, you look at these game logs, and I mean, the Pirates aren't really getting to righty starters. They're doing a better job than they were a month ago, but they're not really getting to righty starters. Uh, and Tobias Harris has been... Tobias Harris... Tobias Myers has been really good in his last six starts. 217 ERA, 099 whip. Um, he has been better on the road this year, but his numbers at, the, at home don't look bad. His last four home starts, 443 ERA, 138. His last two at home, even three ERA and a 108 whip. Um, here are his home away splits, and you can see he's definitely been better on the road this year. ERA, whip, and home runs per nine innings, definitely better uh, on the road. But if you look at the game logs, I mean... His last home start was against the Cubs. Six innings pitched, three earned runs, nine base runners. So that's not a great start. Cubs were able to get to him a little bit. But looks like the Cubs are heating up against righty starters. We were just talking about that in the live show. Cubs put up a big number against the Phillies tonight. So the Cubs might be heating up a bit. Um, home start before that, blank Toronto. Six innings pitched, just one earned run, four base runners. So the point I'm making is I don't really care about those home away splits. Tobias Harris can pitch at home. Um, I am worried about the fact that he struggles against lefty bats, though. 332 Wobin and 147 whip against lefties. Pirates have five lefties in the lineup, including arguably their three most important pieces. Brian Reynolds, O'Neill Cruz, Rowdy Tellez, all in a row, 234 in the lineup. That is a nightmare for Tobias Myers. Also, his pitch mix, four seam fastball and the cutter, those are his two main pitches. Pirates are 10th and 11th in baseball in the last 30 days against those two pitches. So I know putting my faith in the Pirates lineup on the road sounds crazy, and I know their numbers are a bit skewed from that one crazy game against the Mets. I know that, we gotta take note of that. And I know Tobias Harris has, uh, Tobias, Harris, Tobias Myers has been good, but I like those lefties in the lineup for the Pirates against Myers. I also like their numbers against his pitch mix. I think we can count on the Pirates to score at least two or three runs off him here. Uh, on the other side, we got the Milwaukee Bats and everything looking pretty average here in the last 30 days, 17th in WRC+, plus, 16th in OPS, 15th in WOBA. Last 14 days, last seven days, slightly better than that. Their numbers at home have dipped though. In the last 30 days, the Brewers are a bottom 10 lineup at home, which is kind of crazy because you rewind back to May, the Brewers were a top five home lineup. They were crushing the ball at home in Milwaukee. Hasn't really been the case as of late. Their numbers against left-handed pitching, pretty average here in the last 30 days, 17th, 17th, and 17th. The last six lefty starters to pitch against the Brewers, 397 ERA and a 129 whip. So again, pretty average. And if you look at the game logs, I mean, just average as hell. James Paxton, six base runners, two and runs in five innings. Eh. They got to Austin Gomber a little bit. Didn't really get to Justin Steele, but he didn't exactly blank them either. Didn't really get to Andrew Heaney, but he didn't exactly blank them either. They didn't get to Tyler Anderson, uh, but they got to Andrew Abbott. Didn't really get to Kikuchi. So the, as far as the Brewers against lefties, I call the whole thing about average. It's pretty average numbers here. Now they have gotten to Martin Perez though. Perez in the last two years has made two starts against the Brewers. He's got a 12. ERA and even 12 and a 244 whip. So Paris has really struggled with this team. Um, in his last two starts, he's got a 476 ERA and a 150 whip. In fact, his numbers on the year don't look as bad as you would expect. His numbers on the road, though, a little concerning. I mean, in his last four road starts, he's got a 784 ERA and a 174 whip. So yeah, he's definitely been struggling on the road. Here are his game logs. And remember, Perez missed a whole month in there. Since he's been back from the injury, he got crushed in Atlanta. Absolutely smoked. Um, but then he followed it up and pitched into the eighth inning shutout against the Cardinals. That was at home, though. And if you look at the, the road starts, look down at May 15th, right here on the road in Milwaukee, got absolutely crushed. 12 base runners, nine earned runs in five innings of work. 
So he just traveled to Milwaukee on May 15th and got crushed. Now, if you are looking to back the Pirates here, you can point at his pitch mix. He throws a sinker in the cutter. Those are his two main pitches. And the Brewers are towards the bottom of baseball in, against both those pitches. So there's something. But they just saw him. I mean, I guess it was two months ago, but they just saw him. They just crushed him. Martin Perez has given us no reason to trust him on the road. I think we can count on the Brewers to get some runs here. As far as the bullpen matchup, I mean, in the last 30 days, you got to give the edge to Milwaukee. Pittsburgh's bullpen has stepped up as of late, um, but still, Milwaukee's been by far the better bullpen all year. They've been the better bullpen in the last 30 days. So we'll give the edge to Milwaukee, even though the expected FIP numbers indicate Milwaukee's bullpen has been a little bit lucky. Uh, but still, bullpen edge goes to the Brewers. Offensively against bullpens, <laughs> I mean, you give the edge to Pittsburgh, I guess, but... Keep in mind, they scored a shitload of runs against the Mets in that blowout that are skewing these numbers a bit. We know in the last seven days, Pittsburgh is in a top three lineup in the late innings. It was just one crazy game. Um, so, But still, it's not like Milwaukee's been great in the late innings. So as a whole, late innings, slight edge to the Brewers, but not by a crazy margin. As far as betting this game, I'm on the over here. I actually like the Pirates to get to Tobias Myers. Uh, and if that happens, this number should have no problem getting up and over eight and a half. Martin Perez on the road. Martin Perez against a Brewers team that always seems to rock them. Yeah, I bet this over eight and a half. Next up, we got Texas on the road in L.A., uh, Angels are dogs at home here, plus 125, total sitting at nine. We got Michael Lorenzen getting the start for the Rangers. Griffin Canning pitching for the Angels. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got to lean on the Rangers here. 3.24 to 2.92 after five innings. 5.56 to 4.99 final score. So before we get into this one, let's look at some ROI numbers. Uh, these two teams pretty even on the season. Texas minus 11% ROI this year. Angels are minus 8.3. So right next to each other. Texas has been more profitable as of late, though, in the last Last 10 games texas is plus 14.4 percent the thing is that's been coming at home because texas in the last 10 games on the road minus 54.2 percent roi or minus 16 percent roi on the season on the road uh, so texas on the road hasn't been a great bet recently or all season uh, but let's get into it and we'll look at the rangers bats and is this lineup coming to life in the last 30 days looking pretty average for the last 14 days last seven days this is a top five lineup in baseball uh, their numbers on the road last 30 days bottom 10 lineup on the road but last 14 days definitely trending in the right direction uh, as far as their numbers against righties same thing here last 30 days this is the borderline bottom 10 lineup against righties last 14 days top 10 last seven days top five rangers seem to be coming to life against righties uh, as far as ready starters decent i mean last seven righty starters to pitch against the rangers even five era 144 whip if you pull up the game logs they definitely got the zach latell didn't get the uh taz bradley michael king got to adam missouri uh, got to dylan c so i mean there are a couple times where we saw them blanked recently but this is definitely way better than what we were seeing from the rangers lineup against righty starters two three weeks ago so props to the rangers looks like they're finally coming to life offensively uh, screwed my under i had an under tonight uh ended up losing by a half run oh my god they scored seven runs in the first three innings and i was like oh i'm screwed and then i still almost won that frustrating let's uh, we're not talking about last night we're putting last night in the past uh anyway they're matched up against griffin canning uh he's made five career starts against the rangers 488 era and a 154 whip so they've scored runs on him but it's not anything crazy uh, not not too bad um, and the same goes for Griffin Canning's numbers on the year, 487 ERA, 136 whip. Again, not crazy, nothing crazy there. Last six starts, last two starts, maybe trending the wrong direction here for Griffin Canning. Um, as far as his numbers at home, pretty average, 437 ERA and a 144 whip. Now his last four starts though, last two starts at home, 346 ERA and a 108 whip. So back-to-back -back good starts at home for Griffin Canning. But if you pull up the game logs, it becomes less impressive because it's really just one excellent start at home, June 24th against Oakland. His other home start there, June 29th against the Tigers, it wasn't even that good. Eight base runners, four and runs in six innings pitch. And as a whole, looking at these game logs, not a ton of impressive starts here from Griffin Canning. Uh, there was a nice little stretch there where I, I won back-to-back -back bets on Griffin Canning, but... I haven't bet him as of as of late. I'm not sure how much faith I have in him. I also don't like how Griffin Canning has done a lot of his damage this year against bottom 10 lineups. 288 ERA and an 096 whip against bottom 10 lineups. When he sees good lineups, he tends to struggle. And if the Rangers lineup is heating up, I mean, I don't want to be anywhere near Griffin Canning. Uh, he also struggles against lefty bats, which is pretty terrifying here. 371 Woban, a 157 whip against lefties. Texas is scheduled to have one, two, three, four, five, six lefties in the lineup. So that's a pretty ugly look 
uh, there for Griffin Canning. Pitch mix wise, not too bad though. He throws the four seam fastball, the changeup, and the slider. Texas, 16th, 22nd, 16th against those three pitches. So that's not too bad. Overall, if this Texas lineup is heating up with a bunch of lefties in it, I don't want to have any of my money on Griffin Canning, that's for sure. On the other side, we got the Angels bats and last 30 days, bottom 10 lineup. Last seven days, this is the worst lineup in baseball, 30th across the board. As far as their numbers at home, though, they look much better. In the last 30 days, 15th, 15th, and 15th. In the last 14 days, actually, <laughs> looking like a, a top 10 lineup at home. Super small sample size, though. Um, as far as the, their numbers against right-handed pitching, Again, last 30 days about average. Last seven days, one of the worst lineups in baseball. So the Angels have definitely gone cold in the last week or so. Uh, the last six righty starters to pitch against the Angels and even two ERA and a 108 whip. So they haven't been getting to righty starters. And you pull up the game logs and it's an ugly sight here. Didn't get the John Gray, Joey Estes, Mitch Spence, Casey Mize, Reese Olsen, Kenta Maeda. I mean, that is crazy. Did you see? Did you hear those six names I just read off? Those are the righties that are blanking the Angels. This team is not touching right-handed pitching. Um, and now we get to uh, Michael Lorenzen, who's been pitching well. I mean, on the season, 321 ERA, 118 whip. Last four starts, last two starts, not quite as good, but still solid-looking numbers. I'm a little worried about his expected FIP. Uh, those, uh, those of you that like those expected FIP numbers, that indicates he's definitely due for some regression. Um, but then we look at his numbers on the road, 327 ERA, 122 whip this season on the road, solid. Last four road starts, solid. Last two road starts, the numbers jump a bit. Um, so let's take a look at the game logs and see what we're looking at. Baltimore, that's what's skewing the numbers. On the road in Baltimore, June 29th, Orioles definitely got to him. Eight base runners, five earned runs. I mean, other than that though, these are, this is nice looking game logs. He did struggle on June 7th against the Giants, but Five of the seven games on this graphic are good starts. So some solid looking game logs here for Lorenzen. Now I will bring this up. I'm not sure if this carries any weight into the handicap, but Michael Lorenzen actually has been slightly worse against bottom 10 lineups. And the Angels are definitely a bottom 10 lineup. So I, <laughs> I don't love the look at that. Against bottom 10 lineups, 338 ERA, 130 whip. He's got a 103 whip against top 10 lineup. So, I mean, I don't know if they're, like I said, I don't know if that carries any weight, just worth mentioning. Another thing that kind of scares me here for Lorenzen, he struggles against righty bats. He's got great numbers against lefties, 235 Woba, 098 whip, but against righties, 366 and a 140. Angels are an extremely righty heavy lineup. In fact, they're projected to have seven righties in the lineup. I don't like that at all. Um, pitch mix wise though he looks fine he throws the four seam fastball the sinker and the changeup angels 28th 18th and 9th against those three pitches look it's the angels they've been ice cold they haven't been touching righty starters i have no reason to have any faith in them but michael lorenzen struggles against righty bats they have a ton of them he struggled against bad lineups and they're a bad lineup so i don't like the look of that at all as far as the bullpen matchup pretty even on the last 30 days, the Rangers are 12th in ERA, 17th in Woba, 14th in expected FIP. Angels, I guess, slightly worse than that, but only because of the expected FIP numbers. Uh, offensively against bullpens, again, I guess, slight edge. Texas, but uh, nah, nothing really here. Uh, pretty much a crapshoot in the late innings. But when you take into account the Rangers bullpen usage, kind of swings towards the Angels. Uh, Rangers bullpen a little bit on the tack side. David Robertson for the last five nights. Jose Leclerc's thrown on back-to-back -back nights. Kirby Yates threw 18 pitches earlier tonight. Uh, so Rangers definitely going to be missing a couple of their key arms. I mean, Yates should be available, but he's thrown three of the last five just through 18. So that definitely swings the late innings towards the Angels. Is that enough to get me to bet them, though? No. But that's the way I'd lean here. It would be Angels or Pass at this price. I don't want to be stepping in front of the Rangers bats if they're about to heat up at all. But at plus 125, the Angels have been better at home. That's the only way I'd go here. Angels plus 125 against the tax bullpen or pass. Next, that would be Atlanta at Arizona, but we're unsure of the starting pitchers here. I think, well, it's going to be Charlie Morton for the Braves. I think it's going to be Slade Ciccioni. Um, MLB.com still has this as to be determined. So I'm going to skip it for now. We'll talk about it on the live show, which brings us to the final game. Toronto on the road in San Francisco. Giants are favored at home here, minus 150. Total sitting down at seven and a half. We got Chris Bassett pitching for the Blue Jays. Logan Webb on the mound for the Giants. Let's take a quick look at the spreadsheet. And according to the model, we got a solid lean on the Giants here. 2.95 to 1.96 after five innings. 5.07 to 3.75 final score. So before we get into this one, let's look at some ROI numbers here. Uh, Giants have been the more profitable team, minus 4.7 on the season. Toronto's minus 13%. Giants have also been profitable in the last 10 days, plus 12%. They've been 
profitable at home as well. Plus 3.4% on the season, plus 7.6% in the last 10 games. Toronto has not, has definitely not been profitable on the road. So let's get into this one. We'll start with the Toronto Bats. Last 30 days, this is a bottom 10 lineup. Last seven days, this is a bottom six, bottom seven lineup. Toronto's numbers not looking good offensively. Same goes for their numbers on the road. Last 30 days, 24th, 24th, and 24th. So they haven't been hitting. They haven't been hitting on the road. And they haven't been hitting right-handed pitching. In the last 30 days, this is a bottom 10 lineup against righties. Same goes for the last 14 days. Actually, in the last seven days, it's even worse. Closer to a bottom five lineup against righties. Uh, if you look at their numbers against righty starters, they're not getting to him. The last eight righties to pitch against the Blue Jays, 389 ERA, 125 whip. Last three righty starters, even worse than that. When you look at the game logs, we can give them a little bit of a pass, though, because they saw Seattle. And no one's hitting those Seattle pitchers. And actually, they got to Kirby a little bit. Eight base runners and th three earned runs in, in six innings pitch. By George Kirby standards, that's pretty good because he's been blanking everybody. Um, they also were active against Emerson Hancock. Seven base runners and two earned runs. I mean, other than that, though, didn't touch Luis Castillo. Didn't touch Renel Blanco. Got to Aragetti, which is solid. Hunter Brown, six shutout innings, Garrett Cole. So as a whole, we know Toronto's not getting to righty starters, but maybe showing a little bit of signs of life as of late. Um, now, we do have to mention they got to Logan Webb the last time they saw him. June 28th of last year, he only made it five innings, eight hits, five earned runs. So they rocked Logan Webb the last time they saw him, but to be fair, it was over a year ago. And Logan Webb's having an excellent season. 309 ERA, 122 whip, 310 expected FIP on the year. Last six starts, last two starts, just as good. I mean, he's been consistent. His numbers at home look excellent. 213 ERA, 107 whip, 311 expected FIP. Last four home starts, last two home starts look just about the same as that. Uh, here are his game logs, and I mean, he struggled on the road in St. Louis June 23rd. Other than that, I mean, can't really find any bad starts here. Logan Webb's been solid. He's also got favorable splits against righty bats. 272 Woba, 114 whip. Now, it's not that much better than his numbers against lefties. The only reason I'm bringing this up, Toronto's is an extremely righty-heavy lineup. Six righties projected to me in the lineup, so that's a good look for Logan Webb there. Also, his main pitch is a sinker. He throws it 38.4% of the time. Toronto against that pitch in the last 30 days, 29th in baseball. Look, I, uh, <laughs> I'm sure there will be times to buy low on the Toronto lineup, and they have seen some tough right-handed pitching recently. So, I mean, there will be a time I'm down to, to <laughs> put my money on the Toronto bats, um, but not against Logan Webb. So I, I expect Logan Webb to pitch fine here. On the other side, we got the San Francisco Bats seem to be trending in the wrong direction here. Last seven days, bottom 10 lineup in baseball, 26th in OPS. Uh, their numbers at home look great, though. In the last 30 days, this is a top 10 home lineup, so that's solid looking for San Francisco. Their numbers against right-handed pitching, I mean, average in the last 30 days, bottom 10, but last 14 days, last seven days, closer to the middle of the pack. They have been getting to righty starters, though, and I was talking about this on the live show the other day. The last six righty starters to pitch against the Giants and even six ERA in a 163 whip so they have been getting to righty starters and when you pull up the game logs i mean carlos carrasco okay i'm not, I'm not gonna throw him a parade for that one but they got to tanner bybee who's having a great season got to charlie morton they got to reynaldo lopez also having a good season they got to tyler glass now obviously a great pitcher so there's definitely evidence here the giants are getting to right-handed starters recently bad news for the giants though Chris Bassett absolutely blanked this team last time he saw him, June 29th of last season, so just over a year ago. Six shutout innings, just three hits, 12 strikeouts. So Chris Bassett masterclass the last time he pitched against the Giants, and Chris Bassett's been excellent this year. In his last four starts, he's got an even three ERA to 146 whip, and look at this dude's numbers on the road. Chris Bassett, in his last four road starts, what the hell is this? 108 ERA and a 104 whip. If you've been betting MLB for multiple seasons, you know, historically, Chris Bassett's been a fade on the road. It's been the opposite of that. I mean, he's been so good on the road recently. Here are his game logs. You can see he did struggle on July 4th against Houston. Astros definitely got to him. But before that, I mean, there's a lot of really nice looking starts here. On the road in Boston, seven innings, just two earned runs, six base runners. And the Red Sox had just seen him six days prior. So it makes it even more impressive. Uh, great start on the road in Milwaukee, nine base runners, but no runs. 
there's some really i mean chris basic let's give him some credit he's been pitching well now i am a little concerned with his splits against lefty bats 342 woven a 159 whip 485 expected fit giants are projected to have one two three four five lefties in the lineup so i don't like the look of that uh for bassett also his main pitch by far is the sinker throws it 41 percent of the time in the last 30 days the giants are the third best lineup in baseball against sinkers so i don't like that either overall on this side i mean it's really tough to argue with chris bassett's numbers on the road recently they are really impressive but I like this Giants lineup against righty starters right now. I like that they ha they're going to have a bunch of lefties in the lineup against Bassett. And I like that they've been hitting the sinker well. So I think the Giants are going to get to Bassett. I do. I'm down to fade him even with those crazy those crazy numbers on the road. I'm, gonna, I'm down to fade Bassett here. Uh, as far as the bullpen matchup, definitely edge goes to the Giants. In fact, finally, the Giants bullpen is starting to produce a bit. In the last 14 days, 12th in ERA, 17th in Woba, 7th in expected FIP, which is so much better than how they were looking a month ago or pre pretty much for most of this season. Um, either way, <laughs> anything's better than Toronto. That bullpen's been terrible. Bottom three bullpen in the base in baseball the last 14 days. Offensively against bullpens, I mean, I guess last 30 days you give the edge to San Francisco, but to be honest, neither of these offenses have been active in the late innings. So kind of a wash there. Edge in the late innings goes to the Giants. Now you would think the Giants just won a 4-3 game that they probably use some of their high leverage arms. Actually, no. I mean, the, the Blue Jays blew a 3-1 lead. So the, Toronto's actually the one that used a couple of their arms. Both these bullpens are going to be rested. In fact, the Giants bullpen is three or four days rested. Uh, so yeah, it, it would only be Giants here. I'm not going to play it at this price, though. Minus 150. Bassett's been so good on the road. Not going to lay minus 150 against them. But I think the Giants win this game. So it would only be San Francisco. Maybe San Francisco minus one and a half at plus 150 or something would be the way that I bet it. Giants are passed. Live show, 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. We'll go through every single game on the board make our final decisions uh top bets will be posted on kylecrims.com if you're subscribed to sauce network plus uh, it comes with the top uh top bets access to the discord and you get to participate in the weekly betting league hundred dollars and a trophy go to the winner every single week if you're interested in that head over to the website sign up for sauce network plus let's have ourselves a bounce back wednesday good lord i need it coming off one of the worst baseball days of the season. The season's been really great to me. I mean, I knew eventually a day like this would come, but you never prepare for something like this. 05 and 1 sucks. So let's bounce back. Remember to bet responsibly. Talk to you in the Discord.